So is this, it is working, great. Okay, well, first of all, thank you to Maria, thank you for the CDC for inviting me. It's a great honor uh, to come here, to come back uh, many times here, but uh, I particularly, I also want to thank you for uh, arranging uh, the weather today and reminding me what the weather is like every day in Rochester. <laughs> Um, where have you got the uh, clicker? Did I pick it up? Oh, here it is. Okay. So I called this talk "Drawn to Water: uh, Design Stories of City and River." And they, the reason is I'm fascinated by the the notion that as uh, a landscape architect, we draw. That's how we envision landscapes. But it also is very much about how. Um, can describe it, that uh, we as human beings are drawn to water. We are 65% uh, water ourselves. Uh, we go to the shore for vacation. So there is this kind of integral relationship between people and water. And I think that we are now, uh, rivers have always been um, important to us uh, and important to cities, but even more so now, and I hope we'll to show you some of the projects that we're currently uh, involved in, the design of, and uh, are underway. We'll start to talk about how one remakes this relationship, how one celebrates the uh, connection uh, between cities and uh, uh, water. These kind of veins that run through uh, the center of cities that bring air, bring nature, and really start to reconnect us with uh, that sort of biophilic sense of uh, who we are as human beings. I've always loved the um, uh, the way that Olmsted used to talk about uh, the value of public parks. He used to talk about them as recreative. They allow you to recreate yourself. Uh, he talked about them as being gregarious. They are places where you can come together and be together as communities. He talked about them as being exertive, that they're places where you can work up a sweat, you can be healthy. And finally, he talked about them as being uh, educational. They're ways of connecting you to a larger uh, world, and uh, no more so than uh, rivers and the way that rivers, uh, as it were, have a watershed, they flow through a city, they, they sort of infuse a city with uh, uh, their nature, and then they flow beyond. So this larger connection, understanding how we are part of a wider world, is a critical um, part of, I think, the value of uh, uh, rivers and cities within, uh, or rivers within uh, our world. Uh, philosophers and poets have taught uh, much about water, and I've, these are just three uh, quotations to sort of set us up that this sort of notion that is this magic uh, on this planet, it's contained in water. And some of that magic, I hope, will come through in some of the projects. And uh, W.H. Warden, thousands have lived without love, but no one without water. That essential connection that we have with water is very much to do with our uh, uh, nature as, as a human being. And finally, that uh, from going back even further, Leonardo da Vinci, that water is the driving force of all nature. And we're living in a time where we're reminded constantly of the power of nature uh, with increasing urbanization, with increasing um, climate change. Rivers express their power of nature within cities. And so one of the uh, driving forces behind many of the projects are really trying to not push back the power of nature, but how can we work with these natural processes to create meaningful places that are about being in the city. Um, a number of years ago, uh, Taisa Wei, who is a professor of landscape architecture at the University of Washington, uh, convened a conference at Dunbarton Oaks. And, Dunbarton Oaks, and uh, in the introduction to the uh, proceedings, uh, said that uh, 
if we are to build and steward, steward more resilient and sustainable cities, we must reimagine city-river connections and approach the city not as a series of individual parcels but, or zoning types, but as a system, both ecological and cultural. We need, that is, to think about the city as landscape. And I think, really, this is a realization and one of the p wonderful things about coming back to Rochester is seeing what Rochester is doing, is realizing this power to see the city and the river as an integrated system and really seeing the river as being uh, part of the future of the, uh, uh, the city itself. I think this is uh, really an exciting part. It's developed as we have been working on uh, the project. And it talks back to the very founding, the DNA of the uh, city with uh, Nathaniel Rochester and Charles Carroll and that plat of land which is where uh, now Main Street crosses over the uh, Genesee and is the site of uh, the uh, future Carroll Park but really, for me and for everyone that I work with, uh, all in the uh, making public space is about, is about bringing people together. It's about that face-to-face -face contact that is seemingly getting so uh, removed from our everyday life. The, the fact that we sit in front of screens, we work in offices, we connect within a virtual world and the importance that we uh, can be together face to face, share our diverse cultural backgrounds, our common humanity, I believe is a strong influence to uh, removing the polarization that we see so much today. So, so much of these projects you'll see are driven by this uh, desire to bring people together in safe equitable spaces that they can share the, this common desire that we want to be together. My connection with Rochester um, is uh, uh, not only that uh, I'm working with T.Y. Lynn and uh, Jim Kraft, who's uh, in the audience, um, on the uh, reimagining of uh, uh, Carroll Park. Um, but also my father-in-law um, was a resident at Strong Memorial Hospital back in the early 60s. Uh, my um, sister-in-law was born here. Um, and probably, dare I say most importantly, my dear son uh, graduated from the Uni University of Rochester uh, last uh, uh, spring and is now uh, gainfully employed as a software engineer at a rather well-known social media company in uh, Silicon Valley. <laughs> and he really loved being here. In fact, he'll be back here a few, in a few weeks' time. It's, uh, it draws him back. He made so many good friends and he loved uh, his four years here. So we as a practice um, have a long history of working on riverfronts. Uh, this is a range that uh, uh, give you a sense. Some of them I'll talk about uh, uh, this evening. Um, but water is uh, a central theme. It really gives life to landscapes. So even if we're not at a riverfront, water is an essential part of the process about sustaining the landscapes. So it is talking about the magic of landscape. It is really about that sort of quality of excitement and uh, uh, just sheer magic that uh, our contact with water can bring. And there's a photograph on the bottom right that I always love. It's uh, a park that we completed a year or so ago in uh, Dilworth Park. If you ever go to Philadelphia, the City Hall, there's a park in front of it and there's a fountain. And this is uh, a photograph that uh, one of our colleagues took of uh, that sort of sense of why water is so important. And the history of the firm goes back a long way, back in the late uh, uh, 70s, in fact, we were part of the master planning team for Battery Park City. And even here, you can see in the drawing on the right-hand side, the desire to bring the urban fabric to meet the river, the Hudson River. Here, we meet it in a, uh, a promenade on the edge of the river. Uh, we probably wouldn't nowadays uh, create so much fill 
in a river. It's not something that is really uh, um, kosher nowadays, but that was uh, in the late 70s. But the important thing to mention here is that the calibration of the river edge, in this case, uh, an edge where you can be out under the sky, you can get the wonderful view of the river, but then just a few steps behind, there's a very different esplanade, uh, parallel, which is shaded, you can sit down more quietly. This sort of notion of this sort of dual edge, this multi-edge, is one way of being able to experience water in many different ways. And now, uh, at the moment, one of my, uh, or a couple of my partners are um, working with, uh, on the uh, Los Angeles River, uh, 51 miles, just over 800 square mile watershed. Um, and it's very much a project that is um, in the public eye. It's an update of a master plan that was done in the 1990s. And we have been working slowly and diligently um, doing inventory analysis, putting the results of all those survey, surveys up on the web, inviting comments, and as it said, as it says here, your voice matters. It's a project where we're trying to gain uh, an input from the community because that will be s fundamental and central to the proposals about how to re reclaim the river as part of the human uh, system. So this evening, what I uh, we'll be sharing with you our five uh, projects. We'll do uh, a ring around the uh, northeast and end up uh, back in Rochester. Um, I want to begin by talking about a little project in uh, Burlington City on the Delaware. Uh, we'll then uh, uh, show you some of the work we've done at Mill River Park, uh, which is on the uh, Rapawan River in Stamford in Connecticut. We'll then go down to the Alexandra waterfront in uh, uh, Alexandria, uh, just south of DC, 11th Street Bridge in DC, and then come back up to uh, Rochester. And here are uh, a series of aerial uh, views. Um, Mill River is, um, uh, the first phase has been uh, constructed. Uh, Alexandra waterfront is uh, in progress, uh, and all the others are in various stages of uh, planning and implementation. So Burlington on the, uh, it's a small town of about uh, 10,000 uh, uh, people on the um, Delaware River. Uh, I've put together these scale comparisons so you can get a sense of the relative scales of each of the uh, uh, projects. As you'll see, uh, Charles Carroll Park on the left-hand side is almost the baby uh, of all of them. Burlington is about a third of a mile uh, long, um, and I've characterized this as giving uh, form to community aspirations. And uh, in the spirit of telling stories about the uh, projects, um, this particular one I was sort of fond of that I'll read. An old analyst tells how the English founders of Burlington coming up the Delaware in, seven, in uh, 1677 caught their masts of, their, of the ships on an overhanging tree and how the ship's passengers, unconscious of Philadelphia that was soon to be, this was a few years before Philadelphia was founded, um, were struck by the beauty of the site and spoke of its fitness for a town. And the beginning of projects is really showing that you appreciate and value uh, where people live. And this journey that they had been on for uh, over four and a half thousand miles across the Atlantic, and even the, this is the shield, it's a ship called the Shield of uh, Stockton um, in the northeast of England. There's even the uh, uh, inventory of all the uh, settlers that came over at that time. And here, uh, a late Victorian photograph of the um, uh, buttonwood tree, the sycamore, where it is uh, said that the uh, the mast bound on. This is a town that has a deep sense of its own uh, history. Um, and like so many towns on rivers, and this will be a theme that we'll see throughout uh, the, the stories of these uh, riverfronts, is that uh, it was um, built up, it was very much an industrial edge. There was a tradition of uh, boat building. This photograph was taken in the 1960s. 
very soon after this photograph, this was after a lot of the businesses had um, uh, uh, lost their economic base. They were cleared away in pursuit of urban uh, regeneration or uh, urban development and nothing was really put back. It was just lawn. There are playing fields. It was loved. And one of the wonderful things about some of the uh, projects that we, um, the community outreach was we met still quite a number of the uh, residents who were displaced. It wasn't only the industrial buildings, but it was housing. And so uh, a number of the people were really fascinated by the what the project could do to sort of start to reclaim some of the uh, uh, meeting of the river. And so this is a, a plan. It's uh, a part of a lot of trails that run along the uh, uh, Delaware, some implemented, some envisioned. The big pink line is their main street that connects directly to the uh, uh, end of the Delaware at the top. So you begin by um, uh, talking with the community. You want to understand uh, many aspects about it. You want to see the, the uh, promenade, in this case, through their minds. Uh, my colleagues uh, uh, sat down. We had pencils and papers, and we drew some uh, some of the community drew, we drew, and you can see just these sort of very crude sketches. And it's something you know Maria uh, and the CDC do all the time. It's kind of the very nature of what they do. Um, on the bottom left hand, uh, I went to the local high school and we asked the high school students what they uh, uh, wanted uh, from the park, and they had a wonderful kind of ideas. Uh, they played sports there, but. Uh, um, they wanted to hang these big urban swings out on the trees right next to the water so they could swing out onto the uh, water. I, I don't know, I didn't think their parents would like that idea too much. So that didn't get in the plan, but you know, it, they, they now have a sense of what landscape architects do. We also wanted to find out through uh, an online survey how they used it, what they valued about the uh, promenade itself and so the the classic word cloud which uh, uh, talks about how um, they valued it what in this particular case what do you like most about the riverfront today so we knew that those things that people like about it are things you have to protect and keep um, and Ultimately, they're quite simple and straightforward. The, they love the space, they love the view, they like the contrast of the urban fabric. They like to come out and see the space. They love the water and the sky. Um, they're kind of a romantic bunch. There's a, because it faces north-west, uh, in the summer you get these wonderful sunsets, and that's the Bristol Burlington Bridge. It's a wonderful piece of engineering on the left-hand side. So they love to come out and be there and, um, in the uh, sunsets in the uh, uh, summer evenings. There are programmed events. They loved being, uh, they loved the events, the concerts that were put on there. They loved being outside together, this gregarious quality. And um, importantly, uh, they loved the sports, the schools uh, came there, they played soccer, they played uh, softball. And these were great times because parents and grandparents uh, siblings used to come and watch uh, the, uh, the kids play. So it was a great way of bringing many generations together outside. And so we developed a number of principles. Again, the importance of reconnecting to the river, uh, revitalize the water's edge to embrace history. This needed to talk about the history of the uh, uh, promenade. Um, it was foster fitness, sports, and play, of course. Uh, they were interested in the art and culture, and there are various organizations that promote art within the uh, um, city, uh, celebrate community, enhance habitat, because it is um, connected to some wonderful um, uh, green areas either side. So these were principles that guided our plan. All landscapes are layered. You have various planes that you build on. Uh, importantly to bring the urban fabric to the water um, in pedestrian paths to connect, to reinvent the uh, promenade itself, have a nice big generous rail that people can lean on and look out over the uh, river. We sort of planted, had a fatter edge with shade that uh, 
was, as it were, the threshold that brought you in from the uh, city and it was a shady area that you could sit out and watch the uh, sports going on. Um, children's playgrounds along that edge as well. And then uh, celebrating that sunset, a line that uh, runs out to a little overlook over the river that points toward the uh, sun setting on uh, Midsummer Eve. Uh, then to expand the uses, uh, thinking about how one could light it in a way that retained the quality of the night sky but still allowed you to see the river and feel safe. Uh, embracing history, we had this sort of funny notion that there was a history of shipbuilding there, so could that history of shipbuilding inform a new band shell that they uh, wanted, the old ones falling apart? Um, and also thinking about how um, this space could be used. There was an idea that you could actually have paid events on the river, um, even some of the big uh, organizations that run um, bands could fence off part of it and gain income from uh, using uh, it for um, uh, events and there are big uh, shopping centers that could act as uh, parking uh, remotely. Uh, working with them to look at the events throughout the year. So this is a calendar that has all the events that happen during the year but also adds some that expands the use throughout the uh, uh, winter months. And so here's that community lawn, here's a band shell that recalls the uh, uh, history uh, of uh, shipbuilding and then the, um, uh, you know, how you'd have outdoor movie nights and uh, 4th of Ju July uh, celebrations with the backdrop of the, uh, the water. So that's uh, work that we did for a small community on the Delaware. We now go up to Mill River Park, a very different uh, 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 community. This is uh, over 100,000 in Stamford in Connecticut on the uh, Ripawan River. Uh, you can see it on the right hand side. It's uh, a mile long. Uh, this is the, uh, the master plan for that and I've just characterized this as water as connective urban nature. Increasing urbanization um, throughout history has uh, caused much flooding and so the project was very much a collaboration with the Army Corps of Engineers who had uh, respectfully caused the problem in the first place by <laughs> um, building walls along the river, reducing the uh, width and the capacity of it to uh, drain water out into Long Island Sound. And You can see on the right hand side that the walls over time were lifted up and of course what that does is to separate the uh, city and the urban fabric from the water. So in fact this is a, a classic case you try to solve a problem single-mindedly and then you undermine all the other values of uh, the river. And so this is the, um, the master plan we developed. It is partially implemented at the moment but importantly these are really telling uh, diagrams on the right hand side is the hundred year floodplain at the moment. Uh, an example, a photograph when there was not a hundred year flood but a major um, storm event. And you can see how, even though we've contained the river, we've cut down the channel so it's much deeper, it's much wider. On the left hand side, had we not done the work, that is the flood condition of the hundred year flood. But the important thing you can see is that this is what it looks like now. We've widened the banks. As it's extensively planted. Um, it becomes uh, an element within the city that is connecting the city together and it's putting nature at the heart of the city. It becomes a focus of the city rather than a separator of both parts of the city. And it really, these are photographs of uh, the, um, the wildlife and there's this wonderful duck which what you don't see on the top right is that a duck is being chased by a dog uh, that somebody is uh, walking <laughs> throughout the park but uh, it really starts to become, you can't imagine this is right in the middle of a, a city but importantly again going back to that sense it, it allows people to really experience and touch water. Luckily the low flow of this 
uh, the Rapawan River is quite low and it's not a danger at all. It's very low flow. But in major flood events, of course, it goes very high up. But that, uh, luckily, it's fairly clean water and you can touch it and... Uh, as you can see, it really becomes an attraction. Importantly, it's an outdoor classroom. Uh, they have a program for bringing school kids so that you can start to understand uh, riverine ecology. Um, on the top right, they're putting an osprey uh, tower. Um, they, a lot of volunteers help replant it. So it becomes not only a piece of nature in the city, it connects the city together, it becomes an educational place, and it's a, pla a gregarious place. It fills all those Olmsteadian desires for uh, open space, as well as um, providing a backdrop, an, an argument for why people should relocate to live their way businesses can advocate for it being a wonderful place to live and bring up kids. So that's Mill River Park, Alexandria, which uh, uh, is uh, on the um, Potomac. Um, this is a 20-year master plan. This stuff takes a long time, as I'm sure you appreciate, and so one of the uh, aspects, this is over a mile long. Um, it's, uh, uh, again, another uh, remaking of a riverfront that was historically, uh, the edge was all about uh, shipping, it was about um, shipbuilding um, and uh, repair of ships, about uh, uh, the um, you know, exchange, export, import, and you can see that on the top right there that in 1749 that was the original river edge. Gradually they filled the ground and filled the ground so the whole of the riverfront is on fill. You can see the uh, in orange in 1846 the um, uh, riverfront edge and then the current edge in uh, blue and then underneath in the rendering is how the uh, um, the future is uh, uh, envisioned. And again, one aspect of one generator or force of the project is the fact that the, with uh, the, the uh, increasing uh, amount of water that the Potomac is taking, there have been regular flooding. And so the, uh, one of the goals is to lift the edge up sufficiently to be able to uh, protect uh, property values protect the uh, urban fabric and so what we've developed is a system of um, uh, edges that protects the urban fabric but still allows people to walk right along the edge so on the uh, a sort of eight or ten year flood the walkways would still be uh, flooded and there are various levels so you can walk at various levels down toward the uh, uh, the river and this is a more sort of natural uh, edge and you can see it in the uh, pink color the whole walkway uh, along the edge is what you see in uh, um, yellow there there are other ones where you get the boardwalk you can bring the boardwalk actually out into the water so you can have water on both sides of you and then on a more urban edge where we do lift it up to that height and those are areas that are uh, close by um, various urban fabric, so the edges vary depending on what's behind uh, behind them, so that the uh, it sort of responds to the condition that uh, uh, is uh, in part of the city. But going back to that original um, image of the shoreline, we've using a series of uh, various materials. We uh, recall and remember in the paving patterns, some of those original uh, shorelines. On the left-hand side, part of the palette that says that there's, a, there's both a consistency of materiality to unify the whole shoreline, but at the same time, each edge varies dependent on the adjacent conditions, all the time remembering the historic evolution of the uh, shoreline. Um, and for those of you that know the area, the uh, this um, it's the Torpedo Factory, it's an arts centre along uh, King Street that leads down, this is a sort of central 
point to come down there, and this is a series of uh, um, studies that we did at various stages early about uh, the, the sort of notion that one could have this central connection between the King Street and the uh, water's edge as being a very flexible space that could accommodate many different uh, activities. And in fact, it's one big um, play fountain that can give mist, that can give high uh, water, uh, can in fact be a plaza that you can uh, have events on. So it's a very much a, a flexible space. And to commemorate this or to recognize that as a 20-year master plan, um, at that point at the moment, uh, if you go there now, you'll see in a few weeks' time the completion of a, uh, a temporary pop-up park to start to model the sort of advantages, the sort of opportunities that a project like this can give. And so that temporary park will probably be there realistically for about 10 years, given uh, the, uh, the length of time this will take. But it really is to try to generate that sort of excitement, that, um, as I say, modeling of what a real promenade park can provide for a city. So down to 11th Street Bridge, yet another very different um, project. This is... Um, uh, uh, fairly small, it's about the same length as the Burlington Promenade, it's a quarter, third of a mile, it's a little bit smaller than Charles Carroll. But what's interesting here is that the genesis of this uh, project, which uh, called Connecting Communities, uh, this is the existing condition, the uh, DOT was improving roadways, they built a new road across the Anacostia River, which is the um, this uh, upper road here. They took out one lane of this road and so there was uh, an initiative about what can we do with the piers? Is there some benefit that this can provide that is not just about cars and about getting people from one place to another? Can we actually create a place that is about being in this place and can that place start to connect communities? Because the this is between DC and Anacostia. Uh, the evolution and development of the Navy Yard and the areas to the north of the Anacostia River has created, um, using that dreadful word, a lot of gentrification, displacement, so that Anacostia um, is a community where um, this diagram really, as I'll show a few very powerful diagrams or plans, shows the disparity of income of property value from uh, north of the river in DC down to Anacostia. And so can a project start to um, create mutual benefit between these two? It's also a river that characterizes a forgotten river. It was a place where things were dumped um, and uh, really the communities turned their back on it underlining some of the health disparities. The, the statistics are you know, too, almost too awful to read out, but again, can a project start to help address some of the health disparities that one would see between the north and the south of the river? The not-for-profit organization that was set up to do this worked for over two years, I recall, I believe, um, prior to even engaging designers. This was really um, about working to build trust, to make sure that when they did start to make proposals, that those proposals were built on a foundation not only of trust, but a found foundation of potential ownership by the community. So these lessons, I mean, again, very obvious and things that Maria knows, the sense you, you have to turn up, you have to attend community meetings. It's so much about listening, listening to each other, understanding where each of the uh, uh, members of the community are coming from, what their particular uh, fears and aspirations are. Encourage dialogue. There must be a lot of talking to figure out how to reconcile disparate um, uh, questions and then be open to learning. Um, all fundamental pieces. Important that 
there are always many organizations that are working within these neighborhoods and how do you leverage them? How do you make sure that everyone has a voice in them and that each of them can contribute toward making a place? And again, this is another long um, project. It won't start to get uh, in the ground until uh, 2022, I think. Um, but uh, the, the sort of uh, here the organization creating an Anacostia River Festival. So there's a festival that celebrates by being bes beside the river. They have an urban farming program so that some of the vacant land, so that people are using the land actively um, and uh, in involving artists to create temporary artwork along there. Again, reasons for uh, visiting. And probably most fundamentally important, how can a project, how can the value of a project and the making of the project uh, be invested in the community? How can the jobs and the work that is needed give some of that value, some of that investment, some of the state and federal funds? How can you try to make sure that that stays within the community? Um, and also in this particular case, um, how can some of the increasing property values that one would anticipate here, um, how can you make sure that those fragile community bonds um, are protected and those communities aren't displaced because they can't afford to live there, because they can't afford repairs? What are the ways of doing that? So one of the important uh, uh, parts of the project is an equitable development plan that looks at all these threads to make sure that the communities really uh, uh, almost generated the need for the project don't become victims of its success. Project goals, very similar to what uh, I've been talking about, that connect better with the river, reconnect communities together, improve the public health disparities, and serve as an anchor for inclusive economic uh, opportunity. There's a a lot of uh, information on the website for the project and you can look more at how they have uh, started to grapple and wrestle with these issues which are not um, easy. So from a design standpoint the sort of notion of bringing the two communities together over uh, the river, this is uh, a view high up looking along the Anacostia, this sort of magical view, um, the high level you can see on the top, right, recognize the Washington Monument, the Capitol building, that's the proximity of the project. And so the, uh, we, we um, uh, collaborated with uh, uh, OMA, a firm of architects who may have heard of Rem, Rem Coolhouse, uh, his firm, and so developed the, the sort of notion of this crossing uh, in the middle. And what it did, it gave two points, two viewpoints to overlook the various uh, communities. And so this is the diagram that uh, really is at the heart of the project, the party uh, we would describe. Uh, this diagram, which I always love uh, showing, the white is during the day, the dark is at night. And this is just a sort of diagram of all the things that came out of the community consultation. Uh, uh, consultations, all of the things that they um, saw that they wanted to occur in this uh, space and a sort of idea of when they may occur during the, uh, the day. So it's very much a multifunctional type of space and here applying some of those to the party, this bridge that crosses over on the bottom left, um, how that project is looking at uh, strategies for improving health, of leveraging uh, the quality of the environment and people's health, both environmental and social and physical. And on the right-hand side, in a very minor way, because the issues of river water quality are so big, but in its own way, trying to create uh, small wetlands and ways of cleaning the water as it flows uh, under the bridge. Uh, views within the structure, um, uh, notions of amphitheaters that can look down with the river as the backdrop on the top right, um, learning centers that uh, uh, can be again classrooms for 
kids and then importantly how this park connects into the surrounding urban fabric and these are a series of renderings that we did to uh, explore the various ways that one could connect uh, to the bridge and particularly you can see in the bottom left the sort of notion that again the importance of uh, multi-generationality that there are places for kids or places just to hang out and enjoy the the view and so that's the um, uh, the scheme. This was part of a, uh, a competition where there were many, uh, an open call, and so we were lucky enough to uh, uh, win the uh, the competition. It's now just about to go into schematic design. Um, there's a lot of funding. Our client is uh, the uh, uh, is uh, the DOT, the Department of Transport, and so it's an interesting relationship. Um, to uh, to work with, but we are fully expect it to uh, uh, happen. Um, it's uh, it's going to be a remarkable uh, uh, project, and I hope we hope truly hope it's going to be a project that will really start to bring together these various uh, communities. Now, um, oh, we're back in Rochester. So to finish up with Rochester, this. Part of this presentation I shared uh, last uh, last year, the ASLA were kind enough to invite me to uh, come and talk uh, last uh, summer to a small event of professionals. But um, so here's Charles Carroll Park, about a uh, quarter of a mile long, um, between Andrews Street and uh, Main Street, with sister cities. Uh, uh, Bridge connecting it to St. Paul. Um, I called this nature in the city because that's how we were started to uh, envision it. Um, some critical thinking about a project like this that um, the project should, it's not about a competition, it's about an integrated thing. This, we did this diagram before uh, Rock the Riverway. Uh, sort of emerged as uh, an idea, but it was very important for us that this should be a park that complemented all the parks that uh, exist in Rochester at the moment. Um, important was connecting uh, along the uh, Genesee River Trail, that's a critical uh, component of it, and then uh, the, the notion that it's a sort of nexus, it connects both the uh, Genesee River, but it also is connecting St. Paul with State Street, with uh, City Hall. So it's that sort of central point is a really important point. But um, and and that uh, as a garage underneath, as a parking structure underneath, it is also uh, a gateway into the uh, uh, city as well. You emerge and you rise up, and so it's a way of introducing the city and the idea that they come into the city and they go through a park to the city and, and they're on the Genesee River Trail which is part of this bigger system. Um, seemed to be a very kind of exciting prospect for what the project could do but it was built in the 1960s, um, a time when equity of access was not seen to be a priority so uh, um, architecturally it's very interesting the way the levels change but if you have a wheelchair, a stroller or find it difficult it's impossible to navigate so a major piece of our um, project was trying to overcome some of these obstacles to access because if people can't get there or don't want to get there it won't be a success so we worked very hard to figure out how to overcome a lot of these and then important this is a plug for what we do as landscape architects basically the top of a garage is just a whole lot of concrete so we're creating an artificial nature. We have to recreate natural systems on top of that and this is a diagram that we use to talk about all the different types, planting typologies that need to be um, created. We have calculations for how much soil volume you need to plant a particular tree, um, what are the sort of soil typologies that work in urban situations and working with uh, Jim and his crew to understand what the load bearing capacity of that roof is so that we can actually put the planting that we want on top of it. And reaching back and understanding deep into what um, Rochester is, its DNA, 
Um, and so when you start a project, you sort of scratch your head and you try to figure out, you know, how do I even get into this? You get a lot of feedback. There were text to send surveys. We have Highland Planning as our outreach. And so they gave us a lot of feedback about the aspirations of the project. But a lot of it was about what should the identity of this place be? And so um, being fascinated by the industrial heritage of the city, the current arts and culture scene, uh, the Jazz Festival, the Eastman, and also the fact that Rochester is in this incredible landscape of the Finger Lakes. And so thinking about these as three threads to get us into thinking about how a project might be this remarkable industrial heritage which is down the road from the, uh, the old Erie uh, Canal Bridge. So organizing it as a series of uh, levels that step down these sort of linear uh, levels was one um, thought about how one might do it. Could the vocabulary of treatment be a more uh, robust that recalls some of the industrial, reusing uh, industrial elements, reclaimed elements? Would that be appropriate as the character? Should it be a place for performance? Um, and we characterize this as a sort of performance gallery. Um, should it be a place that is all about all the events and the performances? And so do you organize it as a series of uh, uh, kind of performance rooms that step down to the river and the river becomes the backdrop for these uh, various events? You create a series of rooms that could have um, large-scale concerts, small-scale theater, galleries, installations. Uh, and so that was the second uh, um, sort of thought about how we might uh, address it. And then finally, you know, should this be about the Genesee itself? Should it be uh, a part of the Genesee nature within the city? Um, and this kind of remarkable um, sort of sense that it is connected to that much larger landscape, should it, as it were, bring some of the history of the water as it flows along the Genesee and deposit it in the city to remind the uh, uh, the, the, the citizens of where they are. And so this produced a diagram which was much more sinuous that talked about the forms and the shapes of the uh, Genesee River. And uh, that is, again, these are diagrams that try to encapsulate a, an idea, a seed of a, a project. And of course, what ended up is you want a bit of all of it. Uh, you want to be able to have performances, you want to recall deep into the history of uh, uh, the city, and it wants to be uh, a piece of nature. It wants to be a place for recreating. It needs to be gregarious. Um, it needs to be a place that is exerted and that uh, can be educational. And so working with uh, um, Agnes Lajavadi in my uh, office, she started to look at the Genesee and the forms of the Genesee River and these kind of eroded edges and deep, sort of deep position on the inside of the river. And uh, we started to realize that by creating these curvaceous forms, by taking the um, Genesee River Trail up to meet the hotel courtyard, we were getting enough length to be able to make these accessible slopes to, overgo, to sort of overcome all the uh, changes in grade. So we realized that there must be some, something in this particular approach because it was helping us solve more problems as well as creating this sort of sense of nature in the, uh, the city. So at the top, there's the existing uh, park plan, this sort of 70s, very architectural plan. and. Uh, a grading study, which you can't see the grades, but it's us trying to wrestle with how to uh, uh, navigate the various slopes. And at the bottom, the uh, the rendered plan with the uh, the f the f three the two sorry critical crossing the um, Genesee River Trail and the sister cities going through to State Street. Um, some of the uh, connections, some of the uh, elements retaining the potential for performance uh, in the wire of the Sister Cities Bridge, make, making a better connection to um, uh, Main Street, which we're in fact just working on at the moment, uh, creating an accessible entry from Andrew Street. These connections really being important, figuring out how to give the park presence on State Street 
and also eventually on the other side of the uh, uh, river by the hotel going to uh, St. Paul. And so these are, again, these are early conceptual renderings, but this is the Sister Cities Bridge. This is one of the remade um, uh, towers that come up from the stair. Uh, the idea that these are sort of opened up and become beacons that uh, uh, orient people, uh, a bridge that takes you over, a pedestrian bridge that takes you over to connect to the, um, the trail at the top, retaining the area here for stepping down, looking at the river. This is, stays as a potential performance space. And these are a series of uh, renderings sort of before and after. Again, early conceptual ones, but they try to capture some of the goals of the project, looking back to First Federal uh, Plaza, one of the existing uh, stair towers. And you can see all the uh, blocked uh, views, the, uh, the, the branching structure hides the views of the city. So here, sort of trying to open it up, breathe air into the space, create paths that really are about being on the river, about views to the river. Another view as we're with our back to the, uh, the hotel terrace, the city bridge, the uh, stair tower, uh, again opening up that view, this uh, sort of notion that the hotel can then have uh, a wedding reception overlooking the river, um, looking from Again, that hotel terrace looking towards Andrews Street. Again, the walls really, you know, creating. There's no sort of sense of uh, security, no sense of sort of space. You know, who would know that you were near a river uh, when you see a view like this? But then opening it up, you get the view over to Andrews Street Bridge, which is kind of a really wonderful piece of architecture, the notion of some sort of sculptural element that connects as you're coming across City City Bridge and coming up from State Street, new lighting. Um, this is looking at the trail, the mixed use um, bike trail and uh, pedestrian trail. Another view looking uh, toward the uh, Main Street Bridge. Again, walls blocking the views, these funny little uh, seating areas, and then opening that up um, creating these sort of curvilinear pieces. You'll recognize some of the patterns from the Genesee, creating seating areas off uh, walking paths, the possibility of a little uh, children's playground on the other side, um, that new uh, sort of flyover bridge giving accessibility from uh, uh, St. Paul, sister cities over to the trail, and then, well, I didn't know whether one wants to look at the hotel, but that's in this particular view. Maybe one year we'll be able to look at the art, new art centre uh, over there. And so that's the uh, that's the, the existing view, and that's the uh, uh, initial rendering with some of the views I've shown about what this space uh, might be in the future. Thank you.